So it seems that by the time we come to the mind, surgery is not so popular, and understandably so. Sexual offenders in Germany and some other parts of the world, uh, like some states of the United States of America, they get chemical castration, and that is surgery on your mind, because chemically it will be impossible for them to conceive or having that kind of excessive desire. So if you look very closely, this kind of mental surgery is in place. We just don't call it that way. To the benefit of medical science, we can also say that when somebody is suffering from chronic depression, then sometimes they put electrodes into the brain and it becomes a chemical pacemaker. So there's a certain amount of uh, chemical and bioelectric process that changes the chemistry of the brain. Therefore, depressive feelings and very dark, immobilizing states of mind cannot arise. That's also plastic surgery for your mind. Certain karma is cut out because you cannot handle it by yourself. The question is, can we ever become independent of this? When we start practicing, we do the surgery on ourselves. Without a knife. Without any blood. Sometimes sweat and tears, but no blood. Because when you meditate and you practice very hard, then you realize how much there is to do. But you also realize that in certain ways it's not going to work. If you cut yourself, then only your dualities will increase. And what do we really do most of the time with our consciousness? We cut it into good and bad. We cut it into me and not me. Cut it into like and dislike. So the question is, when we finally put down the scalpel of dualistic thinking, or the knife of dualistic emotions. And when we put that down, we can heal. We can heal. And that's when we can really fix our karma, because when you come back to your true self, to your true nature, then everything which originally did not belong to you naturally disappears. We call that the spontaneous self-cleansing of human mind. It is possible. But for that, you have to stop the hand that performs permanent mental surgery on your consciousness. And say, I'm this and I'm not that. So I cut that out and I throw it away. With the mind, it doesn't work like that. Anybody who studied a little bit of consciousness and subconscious, they know that whatever you repress will come back with a vengeance. And whatever you see, you can have some control over it. You can choose to use that kind of karma or not. What if you discover inside some habit that you are not happy with? Do you follow that just because it was your previous karma this lifetime or some other? Like somebody goes into a very nice department store and sees some beautiful clothing and next thing you know that it's in your own bag and you never paid for it and you walk out of the door. We call that stealing. And it's not so good because it violates a lot of rules and also violates common sense. So you don't want to live with that kind of habit. But if you discover that, then what do you do with that? And there are many other habits like that. Do you surgically want to remove this habit from your mind? How would you want to get rid of it? It's not as simple as cutting off some excess nail or hair. So is there a knife which can cut out this kind of habit? Can you perform this kind of surgery? And like I've said earlier, if people become really trapped by their own habits, sometimes this chemical surgery is performed in one way or another, whether it's purely medical or judicial, but it's done. So how far do you want to get with your own habits? So you realize that the way to remove that is actually not to touch that. It's the diametric opposite of what we think about our body and mind. So you have a bad myoma or a kind of bad tumor or some kind of excessive in the body. First is to cut it out. How do you cut it out from your consciousness? So... 
there are many bad science fiction scenarios when human society is chemically altered because there's this super injection that is injected into your bloodstream and then you become a very nice person without any major uh, bad instincts and bad habits that not just stealing but also killing and violence and all kinds of stuff it turns out that these utopias don't work they don't work even in the movies and the novels but it would work even less with normal human beings we humans are very paradoxical in other words we are not logical beings we have capability for logic but we are not logically constructed beings we are not robots we have opposites we have dualities we have paradoxes things that we cannot explain but we have them so there is no knife that can remove it and that's why there are myths of dragons where you cut down one head and two more spring forth it's called in greek the hydra the hundred-headed hydra if you cut off just one head two more come out so that was based on some deep understanding and observation how your human consciousness works so if somebody has some mind space then you can see your habit coming and then you have also an extended amount of time to make a choice follow that habit or not so if you see your hand going towards the clothes in the department store if you see it then you can stop it but if you don't see it you can't stop it and that's why practicing is so important it doesn't make you look better it doesn't make you into a good Buddhist yeah you can be a good Buddhist and it's very meritorious to do that so be a good Buddhist but practice itself is not about that practice itself is becoming absolutely clear in this moment what am I what is this situation what is my relationship to this situation human and other relationship and what am I doing what is my function in this situation so this kind of function moment to moment must become clear we call that clear direction it's not just a rational set of reasons why am I doing what I'm doing but what do I want with this life and not just with this life with the next life and then the life after that and then the life after that so what do I really want which is the direction where I'm really going not where I think I'm going not where I want to pretend that I'm going but where I'm really going now that direction is undeniable it's with you moment to moment but as we perform plastic surgery sometimes on our face to become different we also perform another kind of plastic surgery in our consciousness when we don't remove things but we implant things in psychology one is called projection and the other is called introjection when you take something out and you believe that the world has it but you don't it's projection and when you internalize something and identify with it that kind of quality which is originally not you it's called introjection so there are th some things some qualities inside that is really not you but you want to think of yourself as a good person as somebody expert or complete or perfect or infallible we are originally not that but we believed that about ourselves we interjected that into ourselves and we badly want to identify with it very very much and that is also plastic surgery but the second kind not removing something but putting something in implanting something it's just as false as the other that's why in the Buddha's teaching uh, the term like this or suchness or in Sanskrit tathata is so important because first of all we have to see ourselves the way we truly are it's really the toughest part and seeing yourself the way you are doesn't mean that you continue like that but some acceptance at first it's really important if you don't accept what you see you cannot use your mirror if you're upset because of what you see in the mirror you will want to break the mirror or smear it or put some painting onto the mirror instead of seeing your true face 
That's why during practicing we, see, we say, keep a mind which is clear like a mirror, clear like space. And in that you see everything. But what you see as karma will ultimately peel off and go away. And something which cannot be put into words remains there. We don't know what that is, so we call it don't know. Don't know is also wrong because it's word and speech. And what we're looking for is not some word or idea or some material form. But when we say don't know, is the least of a mistake, the smallest of a lie. If you call it Buddha or God or some entity with a name and a form and a statue and scriptures, it's much bigger of a mistake. No matter what you call it, it's insufficient to word it or to put it into some kind of cognitive form. Yet our hungry intellect needs that. And then you can go on the path of practicing and attain it. And that's when no words and speech can help you. Your own experience can only help you. The next step is how to use that experience to transform your karma into this into this normal human being who are sitting right here in this room. Is everybody a normal human being? I don't think so. None of us are. You look a little deeper, you open the hood, you see what's going on, what's ticking in there, you find so many things. There's no movies and books that can come even close to what you can find inside your mind. If you dare to open the hood, like in the car, and see what the engine is doing, how it spins around and uses the fuel, uses the coolant, uses everything, we call that entering the stream. Because the mind, the way it functions in this body, is like a stream. In Theravada, they are called Shrota Apan, or stream enterer. Those who enter the stream, actually, who perceive something inside, that there's a flux of human mental content, cognitive, emotional, intuitive, all mixed in a bunch. And that is like a huge river flowing, okay? It's flowing only one way, because we have only one dimension in time. We call that impermanence. So everything you experience, even the best or the worst, the happiest, the saddest, everything flows down the river of time. But if you are watching very clearly, if you attain this not moving mind, then you are on the shore. And this kind of not moving mind is the key to perception. If you are jumping into the river, you're fighting the fish, you're fighting the crabs, you're fighting the sharks, etc. But you're not at peace. And this peace is not for diplomatic purposes. You can't maintain that too long. But this peace is your tool. It's your asset in your consciousness. And if you have that, then you have the most important tool, which is not a knife. It doesn't perform surgery inside. But this kind of Buddha nature, or don't know, or this clear mirror consciousness, that's the way to reflect. And there are many ways to practice that, but one important way is what we call Huadu, or the great question. And this question is not a doubt. Some of you have heard this, but it's not bad to hear it over and over again. In the West, sometimes it goes as great doubt. Now, ladies and gentlemen, doubt is between zero and one, hamburger or fish burger, or uh, water, or some other beverage, that's doubt. Because you have two things to decide in between. That's doubt. But this great question is not a doubt. This question brings your mind back to this moment, to one point. Only one point, not two. There's no decision to make. There is no answer to give. That's why the great question is not some small question, not some small doubt or small choice or about something material or some cognitive content. It's not about good or bad, right or wrong, enlightenment or suffering. 
It's about bringing your mind back to before thinking. And before thinking, there is no doubt, because there's nothing to produce that doubt. So this question, what is this, or what am I? That brings your mind back to this moment. That takes all the small doubts away. And this moment can expand into this infinite time, infinite space, clear mirror consciousness. It's up to you. How much you are attached to your little toys inside, and how much you are ready to give your old habits up to become something that you have always been, but was covered by this thick river of your karma. And fortunately, in Buddhism, we never take your choice away. The most you hear is encouragement. That's it. The most you hear is an elucidation or some kind of demonstration. But the way is something only you can step forth to. Only you can begin. And no one will, will make you do that. Remember when the Buddha got his first enlightenment? It was not really as a monk. It was still as a prince. It was when he realized that all this that he had as a lifestyle is not going to help him. It's not going to help him answer the basic question of human life. Why are we born? What are we doing? What happens when we die? Questions of this depth cannot be answered by external means. So when this clicked, he left everything behind, and then he started to practice. That was his choice. Not his father's choice, that's for sure. Not his family's choice or his cart driver's choice, his own choice. So, in our tradition, what is it that will first teach you? It will be your suffering. Your suffering first teaches you. And when you want to do something about it, then meditation can come in as helpful. A method which will bring you good results if you practice. But no one's going to do the job for you because you didn't import your suffering through some commercial agency or from another country. If you practice, you realize that suffering is something you made for yourself. So if you made it, only you can unmake it or stop making it. And for that, the best surgical method is put it down. Put down your knife. Put down your dualistic thinking. Don't cut the world into good and bad. Don't want to cut anything out of your mind. Don't want to implant anything into your mind. See this for yourself. Don't take it for face value and definitely don't believe just my words. If my words help you to get some experience on this way, then they have been useful. If not, watch a movie. Much more exciting. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think this is plenty for introduction. And now I would like to welcome your questions. Any kind of question. Thank you for your lecture. I would like to be free. Can I be free when I am inquiring, thinking, or not thinking? What would you, what would you like to be free from? Uh, memory dominates me. Whenever I face something, memory comes up and I decide based on that memory. Is that bad? Yeah. Why? Memory is past. Present is reality. So? That's why. Look, if you are upset about your memories, yes, and you don't want to use them, right? you couldn't even talk. You learned these words when you were a child. You learned your sentence formations in school. In your speech, all your past studies appear, and if you want to discard them, you couldn't talk. Would you like that? Yes, I agree with that. However, 
I stuck the some scheme of a memory. Yeah, now we are getting there. So what kind of memory is it that bothers you? We have just established that not all memories are bad, right? Right. So what kind of memory is it that you want to be free from? When I see something, when I confront something, my memory comes up and this is what it is. So do this one, do that one. Always or sometimes? He is, I cannot believe him. So don't trust him. So does this overshadowing or projected memory appear always or sometimes? Money. Okay. Okay, money. I'm now 77 years old and my memory says don't invest or don't be involved with any business related to money. You have enough money to live on. If you are involved with something related money, there are many frauds. Oh yeah. So you might be lose your shirts quickly. So don't be involved in business related to money. But many things, including education, is related to money, money gain. So whenever I organize some education system, mem memory says, tell them you will not be in the management system. You, will, you should be aloof, just to honor. Sir, I think your experience this lifetime is serving you very well. Why would you not listen to these precautions? Why? So where's the conflict? Your memory serves you very well. I would love to be so bright when I'm 77, like you now. I would love my memory to serve so well that I remember names, I remember uh, experiences, I remember things to do and things not to do. Mm -hmm. So when your memory says that don't go into this, it's risky, you may lose, etc., etc., what is it that conflicts with that? What's that? Distrust? No, distrust actually is served by this memory. So where is the conflict? One way is I would like to be involved in the system, uh, especially I created some new academic scientific area which is uh, Management of All Selves, Enlightenment and Empowerment, M-O-S-E-E. -E. So I really want to expand that education system. There you go. But the other hand, money is involved in there, mm -hmm. and uh, people, is more, people are more interested in money okay. rather than M-O-S-E-E, -E, education, spirit. Here you mentioned something really important, and the key word is expand. Now, if you have a car and you want to go to Kangwondo, mm -hmm. but you go to the Chuyuso, the filling station, mm -hmm. and you find yourself as the assistant, and the assistant says, Hui value, mm -hmm. petrol, is very expensive. So I'm not going to give this to myself into the car. Then you cannot go to Kangwondo. So if you want to expand, you have to invest. You need the energy. All my questions were about where do you need this monetary energy for? What do you need this for? So now you have said it. You have an organization. You have a scientific project. You want to expand that. Expansion takes energy. In this world, material energy is money. Right. So either you create the necessary personnel and legal and other circumstances that you could be trusting the system and the people you are working with or you're stranded and you cannot expand. So it's a matter of trust, not a matter of memory.
So in this moment, there is no problem with your memory, which is great. But there is a problem with human trust and vision because the two are in conflict. You need a team. You need some organization structure you can trust, which people can use to expand and realize your vision. But if you cannot energize that, it's not going to happen. So allow me to say, your eyes are looking straight and bright. You have a very balanced personality. There is no problem with memories, but there is a problem with human relationships. Fix that. So rather than having the question, what am I? Have two questions. What is this? And you look at certain aspects of your life, material aspect. You can also ask again yourself, although you're 77, what is money? Really, what is money? Define and redefine again for yourself. What is money? And number two... Money is just your energy. That's okay. But energy. In, a given, in a given context, what is money? So money can easily translate into a train ticket or a pizza. So in that given context, what is money for you? What would you get? So many people are practicing to get enlightenment, but when somebody is asking them, okay, suppose you get it, how would you use it? They have no idea. And the next question you need to ask when you start to work with people, who is this? So first is, what is this? It's easier. Mm -hmm. Next is, who is this? Our eyes can be so deceptive. Our ears can be so deceptive. Our sense of smell and touch can be so deceptive if they are distorted by like and dislike mind. Okay? That's how car saloons work and many other things on this earth work. You know? There's a very expensive car, an especially beautiful woman standing right next to the car and she sells the car. Right? So that's how, and males, they all know that. In fact, they ask, do you come with the car? And they are laughing and they know it's a joke, but they still buy it because it pleases them. So if you don't have the distortive effect, then you can see cause and effect very clearly in the material sense and in the human sense as well. So yes, who is this? And you see beyond the appearances. You can perceive who that person really is, and then that's a basis for deciding over trust or distrust. And that experience defines whether you can trust that person, work with him or her or not. But for that, there is a ground rule. You have to understand yourself. If you don't see some karma in yourself, that karma from the outside can control you. If you lie to yourself, if you allow that, then the world can lie to you. If you desire something within yourself, then the world can sell that to you because you want it. So in other words, first trust yourself. And if you understand yourself and trust yourself, you can understand and trust other people as well or not. But the foundation for that decision will be extremely clear. That's why practicing is important. And when people in your situation you know, ask me, uh, how do I make a good business? Or how do I build up a life plan? I always start with this kind of foundation. First, you have to find your own roots, your own identity, your own plan, why you were born. So once you find something clear inside, you can match that with the world and build something on it outside. But if not, we are just following our own ignorance. And where we are ignorant, the world can deceive us. Where we are not ignorant, where we truly understood something inside, we can master that. We can use that. And we cannot be used in that field. So you see how far we got from memory? Very, very far. Because memory is not the issue. Memory is a product. But where does that come from? What is it that generates it? How do we use that? How do we see the world fresh and clear in this moment, including human beings? Now, if you consider this bigger picture, then be happy that you have memories. Because if you solve this basic question, then using your memory correctly will not be an issue. When it's necessary, it's there. You can see that it's your projection. You don't believe it. You just discard it. And you return to reality as it is. 
So I wish you have a very good journey towards that goal. You still have a lot of time. You preserve yourself in a very, very good shape. So you have a lot more years to work on this and have some good projects, okay? And uh, right now I, am, I have a tendency saying that I will not get any profit or any money benefit out of it. Also, I'm not being involved in the money game. I only <clears throat> give you commitment to give you that MOSEE, New Scientific Discipline Education, without any salary or anything. That's uh, what I'm having, because I have uh, money to live on, appropriate money. Good. That's my present stance. Am I right? Very good. But like I said earlier, you can deepen your perception. You can clarify your consciousness. And that gives you better foundation for your decisions. Okay? Thank you. More questions? If I can't find the keyword in my problem, then what I should do? For example, um, last summer, I climbed Mount Paegongsan Gatbagi in Daegu. Um, it is not so high, so I just uh, climbed 2.2 kilometers. By the way, um, when I arrived at my des destination, really, I felt so angry and so sad. I don't know why. Okay, so. I can't go forward or go backward just to stop him. I don't know why. What is incurable about this? It's already finished. Mm, continue. I don't know. Where? Continue where? You already came off the mountain. Where does it continue? Usually, mm -hmm. I, I know my problem. Exactly. But in this case, I don't know. What is your problem exactly? Uh, I don't know. I can't find the keyword in problem. So, it is problem or none? I don't know. Well, honestly, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> First, you talked about a mountain going up. After arrival, cannot go back, cannot go forth, you became disappointed and upset, etc., etc. That I understood. It happens. You go up there, you see, is this what I came up here for? Something like that. But the other thing you talk about, that's a mystery. And you know why? Because you want to keep it that way. You want to keep it a mystery. You want to ask about it without revealing it. And heaven forbid, I don't want to know. You should see that inside yourself. That's why I asked, where is it? Where does it continue? It started, continues, and stops inside your mind. And if you practice, you have that mastery over beginning and end. A great Western Bodhisattva, fully enlightened being said, in our self, in our true nature, there is beginning and end, the Alpha and the Omega. That's what he meant. And that's why we have the Heart Sutra that originally no beginning and no end. Originally no dualities. And if you truly experience that, there is no reason for fear. Because there is no hindrance in the mind. So you have a hindrance, you ask about it, but you keep it for yourself. That's okay. But inside, ask, what is this? It's not this huge big question right now, like opening your zoom up to infinity so that the whole universe would fit into that. This question is now about a specific problem, which you see very little, you only feel it. You already feel it badly enough that you want to do something about it, so you ask this question. But deep inside you ask the question and you be honest with yourself and see that. Even if you first see it like that, oh my God, okay? 
even if it's very, very slowly, but see that because that karma is not you. If this was you, it would be incurable. But it's not you. You made that some time ago. You identify with that, so you think it's you. And because you think it's you, that's why you think it's incurable. But your true nature has no coming, no going, no sickness, no health. So there's nothing to cure about that. Everything else is karma. Now, everything else is impermanent, imperfect, and interdependent. So it comes and goes. It's high or low. It's healthy or sick. So it's curable. Mm. See that? So zoom gently into the question. What is this inside that makes me upset and give yourself enough time be patient don't toss it around perceive it very gently sometimes you can see mothers who are not so skillful the child is crying is why are you crying ah, even more crying then slow down you can see sometimes very skillful mothers slow down, just kneel down next to the child and hold her and say, what's wrong? And then little security, trust, etc., love, and then the child will say something or demonstrate something which is the problem. Don't be judgmental over yourself. You judge yourself, you lose yourself. Okay? More questions? I'm very much impressed with your... Uh, with your... Uh, Whatever. Yeah. yeah, we can put that aside. Yeah, go ahead. Would you continue? Would you do continue this? Because I really want to communicate with you in the future. You know, it works like this. I give a little teaser, like a challenge at the beginning, which was even longer than I wanted. And then, based on the questions, I continue. So that if there is reason to continue, I do. If there's questions, I answer. But if there's no questions, it means what I said was uninteresting. So it's worthless. So then I wrap up and go and eat some champong and go back home with eyes dripping from uh, sadness and uh, you know kochuchang, and then I sleep. Up to you. So I'll ask a practical question. Uh, I'm at the point where I'm ready to stop and because um, I know and even though uh, I don't always enjoy this truth but the idea that the answers are inside of me that no one can really uh, not save me or that no perfect job or perfect relationship none of that is is the answer that I'm looking for exactly so I'm ready to stop um, stop what? Stop so that I can really practice and listen. But I don't, the practical question is, I don't really want a temple stay. <laughs> like just a, uh, I don't just want, I want a, a serious stay in a temple or with teachers here in Korea that's extended until I can find the answers because I'm at a point in my life where I'm, transitioning and I'm not sure exactly where the next step is and I know that no one can tell me exactly what that is that it's inside of me people can help you find it but right. no one should or can tell you right. genuinely what right. that is and I understand that um, because I, I do try to listen to myself I'm good at listening I'm a very intuitive person but I'm really having a difficult time with this it's a huge transition I've been in Korea a long time and I'm at the point where I'm about ready to either do something completely different here or go somewhere else. And I'm honestly, I, I try to see it and I can't see it yet. Or it, I'm, I'm having a difficult time. With it. All right. So uh, I think if you ask the right question, you'll get the right answer. Perhaps we can agree on that. So uh, I think if you meditate in the usual way as you used to, and you ask yourself, what is my job? Then that gives you the direction. That gives you the next step. 
if you want to practice uh, extensively in Korea, after the lecture I can recommend you a few places where it's not just a tempo stay program. You go in, you meditate, you also have some people to talk to, and it's uh, not some formalized input-output situation. And it's not just a matter of technique. It's a matter of uh, being with those minds that are doing pretty much the same. Seeking, opening, asking questions, and not being bogged down with orthodoxy or uh, some definitions or some preset forms. In other words, we always say, think out of the box. Well, if you don't think, you are already out of the box. So when you say stop, that's great. That's why I ask, because if you stop your dualistic machine inside, in fact, that takes a lot of courage to do that. We are used to thinking so much that we, no matter how we can sometimes be, not imagine a solution outside of the cognitive realm. Because everything seems to come in some form of thinking or some sensation that we can verbalize or articulate. And that's okay. But if we believe that the source of it is thinking, then we identify the fishing net with the sea. And it's wrong. What you fish out is in, indeed some poor fish or sea creature. But the source is not the net. The source is the sea. So that's why stopping and looking is so important. In every tradition, there is this stopping and looking, which I elucidated earlier with the river and you standing on the riverside or sitting under the tree in front of the river. So in that sense, if you take up this kind of mental position, then whatever supplementary technique you use, whatever sitting position or breathing form, whatever, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But you should have the right question. And if you ask the right question, you get the right answer. So, asking the right question, therefore, is a lot more difficult. Because the answer will just follow. From the situation as you describe it, it is clear that you should find your next step in terms of vocation, life situation. You can ask, what is my job or where do I go next? etc. But even distilling that question takes energy. Distilling. distilling, that means distill it from the noise so that you would get some signal. Okay? So don't cook the bycatch. Cook the catch. Bycatch goes back to the sea. And you catch something, which is the fish that you want, then you prepare it say a few mantras of repentance because you kill the fish, and then you eat it. <laughs> okay. So the right question is most important. And some sustained practice is also important. And just a little practical advice, how to separate the noise from the signal, is, um, you know, when you ask a question, there will be a whole buzz of many small answers optional things, relative things that are coming and going so fast you can't even grab them. And definitely this is not what you're looking for. What you're looking for is the true match to your question. And that's the true answer to that question. And how do you recognize that? And it doesn't move. It stays with the question. In fact, the embrace with the question is stronger and stronger and stronger and then the question disappears. The solution remains. The solution is the combination of the question and the answer. And as long as the answers are buzzing around, <laughs> that means your doubt still can wedge the question and the answer. That means it's not genuine. But when you can 100% believe in it, that means doubt disappears, the wedge cannot go in, boom, combination. And then deeply, intuitively, you believe that and you reaffirm that and confirm that again and again and again, if you wish. But the sign of a true answer is that there's no way your thinking can take that away. And uh, 
then no matter what it seems like, you make that step. Okay? You're welcome. More questions? Uh, I don't know how can I start my question, but I think I live now a dualist life. <laughs> you what? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I'm working uh, at the foreigner's company. So... Um, <laughs> okay, so what is it? I feel uh, in my company, um, if I don't understand perfectly the foreign language or I feel the cultural uh, difference, uh, in my company, I feel me a small, uh, very smaller. Uh, I feel me very timid. I am struggle. Uh, so, okay, outside of, of my company, I'm uh, a little proud of me, but in my company, I have a problem. Uh, most of all, uh, any problem of foreign language, I feel I'm very small. Uh, how can I overcome? Mm, uh, okay, I if I cannot when I when I could not understand very well the foreign okay my Spanish or I cannot speak very fluently. Um, Habla español, por favor. <laughs> so, look, um, this is a very easy thing. You just practice a little more your foreign language. But for that, you need a partner. Language is interactive. So you need a native speaker or near native speaker in the target language, which is Spanish, I think, whom you trust and like and maybe even love. And then... Language practice is this easy. You know how much our emotions determine the way we think and talk? Huge. In fact, when your mouth moves, it's just your heart talking. It uses this machine, of course, to select the necessary words. But if you have an emotional block, there's no way you find those words. So, in a company, what do you get? Stress. And when you're stressed, you can't really express yourself fluently, right? Especially if you are the underdog. That's when you say you feel small. It's inferiority because you don't speak the language that they require and sometimes you don't understand. Therefore, you can make mistakes. And there's always this, oh my God, what's going to happen to me? So find a way to relieve that stress, practice the language and come back with a bright and nearly full knowledge of your you know, Spanish. And then there's no problem. Watch Spanish movies you like, listen to Spanish music, talk to Spanish people. I mean, it's, we, we're not talking about a small kind of pocket language on earth, which would have just a few speakers and no culture around it. Spanish has such an amount of culture around it that you can experience it in tons of ways. Tons. And then you can have a person you know, whom you trust and like and maybe even love. And then you speak with him or her Spanish. That's all you need. And take that out of the company environment. Can work for the company, that's no problem. But don't talk within the premises, especially not during work time, because it's double stress then. Okay? So ease up your heart. Make it fluent. Make it intimate. Make it just completely yours. And then when the language is yours, that means it's connected to your heart. And without emotions, you can't get that. So work on the emotional part of your language performance. Then the company usage will be nothing. And just a little trade secret. Okay. Um, even if you understand the language, try to see where the words come from. In other words, uh, I digress here intentionally. When I came to Korea, I didn't speak a word of Korean. In fact, it was a big surprise that I was coming to Korea because whatever Sung San Sunim would say, I did. So he said, come to Korea. And yes, sir, I came to Korea. And I appear without a single word of Korean. And I realized that 
if I want to practice and work, you know, in the temple, I cannot learn Korean full time because that would take me out. So I had like, in six years, I learned less than four months of academic time intentionally. So with my very basic and very faulty Korean, which also made me feel inferior, what did I do? I had a few important keywords like Kamsahamnida or Puttakhamnida or Chesunghamnida or Mianhamnida. These are the four things that I, I learned. That's important for your survival, but not, not much else. Trust me, not much else. And also when they talked to me, I didn't understand a lot. I mean, I didn't understand so much. I'm beginning to understand now what I didn't understand at that time. But there was something that was coming with my Zen practice, also with my new cultural experience. I began to understand without words, without the vocab, without the sentences, what exactly they are saying. Where this whole thing is coming from. And obviously, it's not something you can verbalize because you don't understand the words. You can see the mind where the words come from. So, since I didn't understand most of what was being said to me, it didn't become a curtain of thinking or a layer that would cover somebody's heart. So, in fact, I could understand where the speech came from better than the speech itself. And later on, I realized I need to understand both. I have to understand the talk, and I have to understand the mind that talks. So for you to ease up the linguistic burden, make one more step. Perceive the mind where that speech comes from. And many times you will see that we don't say what we mean. And we don't mean what we say. If there is a 70-80% overlap, then we are lucky. So you get a fuller picture when you actually see where that speech comes from and add that together with what you understand. All right? I didn't have communication with my first daughter. Since when? For the last 25 years. And how old is she? She's 45. She's now working for... Uh, University of Pennsylvania as a cardiologist professor. You know, uh, 77 age, I have been through very hard time in Korea from Japan, Pacific War, Chinese War, Korean War, many wars. Obviously, my parents passed away when I was young, and we have five. I'm the chief at the age of 13. So I'm pretending to my brothers, I'm a bigger man. I can do everything for you. Don't worry. That was my way of living. And I just push ahead. So all that thing gave my family members, especially my wife and daughters, they are different stage, you know. My brothers and sisters uh, have been through same difficult area. However, my wife and my daughters, a different stage. That was, a, but I have that tendency, hard working, hard driving, push ahead. That gave them stress. So, I went to the United States without any money with them. So we had a hard time, but that hard time, I, I, I was pleased to do that hard time, but they were not pleased. So 
even though she is driving well in the profession and her social life, she says she uh, thinks daddy is not good. Daddy doesn't love us. So I couldn't communicate well. But miracle comes. Last week, she called me and talked over the phone for four hours. And she says, she loves me. Isn't that wonderful? That's a miracle. Yeah, karma turns around. She traveled to the Hartford where they were born. Hartford, Connecticut. Connecticut. Are you from the state? No. England? No. I'm from Hungary, sir. Hungary? Europe, Hungary. Oh. And my father happened to be a cardiopathologist, so I actually seem to understand what your daughter is doing a little bit. If she's a cardiologist, she deals with the heart. And if she deals with somebody's heart every day, she cannot not deal with her own heart. So after a while, she calls you. Yeah. Go ahead. And now, I'm very, I very pray the God and the Buddha, Buddha, and I, but what should I do from now? Love her back. Important. That's it. It's so simple. She opened her heart to you because she probably rea realized that her heart would break if she didn't open it. So she opened her heart after 25 years of not communicating. Mm -hmm. Just love her back. That's it. Express to her your feelings that you may not have ever expressed during your stressful, hard time in the United States because it was always action, some kind of uh, survival, some kind of accomplishment or ambition or family life. But that stage is over. You're in grandpa's realm right now, whether she is married and has your grandchildren or not. But you're in grandpa's age and grandpas are very forgiving. Grandpas are very mellow. Grandpas sometimes even drive slow. You know that. So, love her back. Open your heart to her just like she opened it to you. That's all you need to do. And then much happiness can appear. Even over distances of time and space. Okay? You're welcome. Are all habits bad? Are there any good habits? And should we break good habits? Or uh, when there are bad habits and we manage to break those bad habits, then how do we know that the thing that we break the bad habits, this thing doesn't become a habit by itself? Breaking the, the habit of breaking a habit. Being too smart is also a bad habit. You know that? Thank you. <laughs> so what is a bad habit? Talk to me. So like, for instance, if I do my sitting every day, and this is a good habit. Is it? Sitting every day is a good habit? Then commuters become Buddha, because they sit on the train two hours a day. Is it sitting a good every day for like 20 minutes or an hour. It's a very quick commute. Is it a good habit? I don't know. I, I think it's good. You if, think? All right, continue. It's not? How would I know? For me, you see, there are no good or bad habits, there are habits. And there is a moment when you exercise a certain habit or not. But don't lose your toolbox just because you're unfamiliar with the tools. In fact, open up the toolbox, spread them out, and you see, in this case I use tool A, B, C, D, or E. But if it doesn't fit the situation, then don't. You don't use pincers to drive in a nail. You use a hammer. And when you need a screwdriver, then you also don't want to use a, a, a power drill. So uh, we have all kinds of habits in our mind. We have habits that we never even dreamt of, that we would call extremely bad or extremely good. Okay? So in this room, I suppose nobody has the drive to kill. 
But suppose you were in that movie theater when a guy watching Batman killed like 14 people in Denver, Colorado. And if you had a weapon, wouldn't you have at least disabled the guy, at least injure him, shoot the thing out of his hand? Your instincts would have driven you to that. And if not, second shot into his head, boom, finish. But nobody has that killing instinct as a habit. Otherwise, you wouldn't be sitting here. You would be doing something else. Just don't think you don't have those habits. We store so much in our eighth consciousness. That's our storehouse, which we carry lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. We carry that with ourselves, with all our karma in it. How it's used is judged by the seventh. The seventh is your judgmental mind, your duality maker. And that's when good and bad, me and not me, I want, I don't want, this kind of stuff appears. That's where good and bad habit appears. In the eighth, they are just habits. In the seventh, they become good or bad habits. But what is it that decides what kind of habit you exercise in a given moment? Now, I'm interested in that. Not about good or bad habits. What is correct at 6 a.m. in the morning? Is it sitting? Is it going to the bathroom? Or sleeping? Is it having breakfast or is it sleeping? <laughs> is it lifting the receiver and talking to your friend in Taiwan? So, what is correct? So, moment to moment realize correct situation, correct relationship, then correct function can appear. But if situation and relationship are not clear, then your habits can control you and your function is unrelated to your situation or disruptive or damaging to your relationship. But to cut habits out on an absolute good or bad basis, that's plastic surgery to your mind. Don't do that. So sh sh should we prioritize? Oh, for sure. Depending on your direction. Because like sleeping... We said, we said stealing habit, not good, not bad, but it ends you in prison. So if your direction is prison, then keep stealing. If your direction is not the police box and not the filled out forms and not the thing, then don't steal. So it's also what it brings with. Cause and effect are always clear, are always clear. See whether you want it or not. But imagine you're starving, your family is starving. And there is this huge truck carrying bread with an open tarp and you have no money. Trust me, you would steal a loaf of bread. For sure. Oh, yeah. We would all do. To relieve that hunger, that pain in the, in, in the family, you would run like hell with the loaf under your arm. And that, that stealing habit actually saved a few lives. And it's not good. You know if you repeat that, you can end up in jail. My country has also seen wartime and revolution time and many, many things that made people steal. And if you put them into a different situation, they would never do that. In fact, people are upset if people have stealing habits anyway. But in those situations like wartime or very, very tough, many millions of people, you know, in poverty, nobody blamed. Let's be real here and not moralistic, okay? Let's get real about human life. So there are no good or bad habits. But in a given moment, with a given intention, you may want to stop yourself from doing certain things because you see that cause and effect don't support you. If cause and effect don't support your direction, don't support your person, then don't do it because that habit lands you somewhere else. And it takes a certain amount of wisdom and experience to realize cause and effect instead of discarding a habit as good or bad. All right? All right. Thank you. Good. Good. Um, um, I have a bad habit of regretting what I've done or what I did. Um, I'm sorry, what um, kind of bad habit? Um, regret. Regretting? Yeah, what, what I've done or uh -huh. what I did. And yeah. there are many uh, situations that I have to make a decision between two choices. And then I choose one. And then I regret not to choose the other. And <laughs> This um, happens quite often, right? Yeah, and being so whichever you choose, you regret that you made that choice and not the other, right? Yes, yes. And I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and being regretful um, makes me 
um, yeah, stressful and being regretful bothers and harasses me. And, and then you make worse choices than before and yeah, then you yeah. regret more and then even more stress and then more upset and then worse choice, etc. Yes. So here's where you should stop all that. <laughs> Wherever you are, don't make choice for some time. I'm sorry. You have to do that. So somewhere stop, break the cycle because it kind of, it's a negative spiral. Okay? Negative feedback. Okay? So you can spiral down into very, very bad states of mind. If you make a, a choice, then you discover that it's a poor choice and then you become more stressed and less clear and then even poorer choices appear. No. Okay. I give you a little exercise. You go with friends to a nice cafe or restaurant. Many in Seoul, there are many, okay? And then everybody chooses what to order. And then you tell yourself, whatever I choose right now to eat and drink, I will not regret. You make that choice before, okay? And then suddenly what you choose to eat and drink will start to taste very good. Because you don't doubt. Doubt takes away the experience. No doubt, completely become one. So then this oneness, this full experience of your coffee and bread, or sandwich, or bagel, or cream cheese, or tiramisu, or pizza, or salad, or any kind of beverage or food you can find in metropolitan Seoul area, which is as big as Sumi Mountain, will make you happy. Happiness import. Then even bigger choice can appear. For instance, you can say, I'm staying home or I go to a movie with my friends. And then you decide, okay, I can stay home, fine. I can also go with friends to movie, fine. But whichever I choose, I will not regret. I will finish. Because regret has a problem. You don't finish what you start. You check yourself. You judge yourself. You judge your choice. You judge other people. Don't tell me this is stupid. What did I tell you? What did I say? Can be bad in relationships also. So then what you should do is next is a bigger choice. And, and then you start to trust yourself. When you trust yourself, then the choice becomes very clear. Still, you can make mistake. That's okay. But that mistake is not you. It was your choice. Understand? So then you can choose again and again and refine your mind and refine your choices. Mm -hmm. And although it will never be perfect, but it will give you some self-confidence and some satisfaction that you did what you wanted and you got the results that you wanted. Maybe not in the form that you intended, but you somehow got that. And this kind of accomplishment gives you enough self-confidence not to regret for nothing. Then, and only then, can you truly regret your mistakes. Because if you regret everything, you, you regret basically nothing. Then even if a big mistake appears, then the false regret inside eats the true regret. Sometimes we not only have to regret, we have to repent. We have to say a big, big sorry for what we've done. Because you never saw the consequences ahead. And when that happens, then true regret or repentance can appear. That's also very precious. All right? Regret has a place. But you overuse it, as it seems. So it loses meaning. If you eat a Tolstot bibimbap every day, you know what happens? You get bored. And even the best... Tosot bibimbap, or yachetopap, or denamupap, or hyunmipap. <laughs> but it will seem boring because you do it all the time. So don't do it all the time. Do it when there is a true place and time and reason for it. And then it's okay. Don't lose your toolbox. Just don't overuse it. Okay? You know, sometimes uh, we have very, very um, interesting moments of silence. After the answers or before the questions, we can have this little space and nobody speaks. 
And there are many kinds of silence, like 20 years of silence. Or during the retreat, the silence that you keep because you don't talk. In our Won Kwangsa temple in Hungary, where I hope one day we will all practice together, you keep silence during the retreat. Mugon. You don't project your thinking onto anyone in the retreat. So that's why we don't talk. Then this machine can stop. But there are other moments of silence and that is like when the chukpi is hit three times after a 50 minute meditation. Mm -hmm. And after the third hit is there, you know that it's over, but you haven't gotten up yet. Now that moment of silence is very interesting and very precious. So what is it that comes before and after the silence? I suggest that one day we would go to a music concert, like a classical music in the Soul Arts Hall, where there are many great orchestras and soloists performing. Mm -hmm. And you hear like a Bach or Mozart combination, or as Koreans love Tchaikovsky and Mussorgsky and all the you know, Russian romantics or some German classics like Haydn. Uh, and the music is there in two or three or four parts. And then the last beat is over. There's a little echo in the air. And before the hand claps begin, there is this infinite moment of silence. Now, these are moments worth living for. These are moments worth striving for. So the real question is, in your mind, do you have that silence? Can you attain just one moment of such precious, infinitely deep silence? Because after that, there can be many kinds of thoughts, but your mind will never be the same as before. This kind of unmoving, empty completeness or complete emptiness is what we are looking for. So many ways, so long time. And I certainly hope that one day we find this moment of unmoving and clear consciousness. so that we could all wake up and follow our true path in this lifetime and in all lifetimes hereafter. Thank you for your attention.